Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host Scott Hemingway, back from a trip to Whistler. Oh, a relaxed Scott Hemingway. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That won't last. <laughs> Give it two more hours. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. We strongly advise listener discretion. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and a Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Jump, jump, jump. Listeners who feel they are in crisis can contact the Crisis Text Line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868. In the US or UK, text 741741. The service will match you with a volunteer counsellor who is supervised by a licensed, trained mental health professional. Crisis Text Line is free 24-7 support for those in crisis. For more information, go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org globally. And let's get on with the show. At the end of July 1998, Rhonda Petra Black began telling friends and family that her husband, 38-year-old Keith Black, a local martial arts instructor, had vanished from their West Bank residence in Kelowna, B.C. Some assume that Keith, depressed due to financial and marital woes, had wandered into the woods and died by suicide. Oh. Keith's sister, Sandy Krause, Feeling something was off, pushed for more police action, wanting the facts about her brother's disappearance. Five years later, in the summer of 2003, the answers finally emerged along with Keith's remains. Mm. Someone had murdered Keith Black, and the cops knew who it was. Oh, damn. You are listening to Dark Patine, episode 136, Love and Dishonor, The Murder of Keith Black. Well, this sounds fascinating. Again, just, you know, a uh, hop, skip, and a jump away. I don't think I remember hearing about this one. It wasn't a, a big, overly publicized yeah. case here in yeah. the Lower Mainland, but it was there because Kelowna, people are interested yeah. in your hometown that yeah. something is going on. Yeah, for sure. Like many kids who struggle with life in their youth, Keith Scott Black needed something more, and he found his groove studying martial arts in his hometown of Calgary, Alberta. And his love was Taekwondo. That's fantastic. The martial arts are, are great at giving you structure mm -hmm. and an outlet. Totally. And I, I did as well. Mm -hmm. I, I studied Pai Lung Kung Fu or a white dragon, also called Bai Lung. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found that was really a great outlet for me yeah. because I had some severe anger issues <laughs> At the time, so. Well, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's martial arts really helps people direct that anger, learn how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic discipline to learn. Now, Taekwondo is one of the most recognized martial arts in the world. Yes. And it is the most recognized Korean martial art. You know, there's Tang Sudo and, and other martial arts that are Korean. But when you think Korean martial arts, you think Taekwondo, mm -hmm. or at least I do. Its roots are over 2,000 years old, and it began with the Hwarang Warriors, an elite fighting force who were formed during the Silla Dynasty. Hmm. 
Training their minds ju was just as important as their bodies. And the warriors lived by the code, be loyal to your king, be obedient to your parents, be honorable to your friends, never retreat in battle, make a just kill. All good things, all good points. Except for the killing part, maybe. Well, well I guess I if you if have to. Just, if, yeah. if it's just, Mike. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, um, you know, uh, yeah, I don't want to say anything negative about martial arts, so. The system evolved over the centuries, and it came into its own after World War II at the end of the Japanese occupation of Korea. In 1955, a panel of instructors, politicians, historians, most notably General Choi Hong-hee, decided upon the name Taekwondo to represent Korea's national martial art. The Korean word Tai, meaning foot, mm -hmm. Kwan, meaning fist, and Do, meaning way of. So, Taekwondo translated is the way of the foot and fist. Mm. Very simple. Yeah, I like that. Uh, General Choi wrote the five tenets of Taekwondo as well, and they are courtesy, integrity, perseverance, self-control, indomitable spirit. Wow. Right? Yeah, it's beautiful. He also authored the Taekwondo Oath. It goes, I shall observe the tenets of Taekwondo. I shall respect the instructor and seniors. I shall never misuse Taekwondo. I shall be a champion of freedom and justice. I shall build a more peaceful world. Absolutely love it. Uh, I love these elements in martial arts in general. Uh, I don't think most martial arts are effective in actual fights, but um, in regards to the benefit they bring to you mm -hmm. uh, and your life, it's fantastic. There are Taekwondo dojangs, which are training halls in over 200 countries, and millions of practitioners around the world hold at least a first-degree black belt. Mm, so there sure. are millions wow. of Taekwondo black belts. It has become one of the most popular martial arts in North America and was made an official Olympic sport in 2000 after its audition in the 1980s. Why was I not aware of that? I know judo has been forever. Yeah, I remember when Taekwondo... I don't remember Taekwondo being a part of mm -hmm. Olympic. Wow. Yep. Keith Black loved the structure of the art and took to Taekwondo like a duck to water. He began working his way up through the belts, achieving his first-degree black belt, uh, and eventually acquiring his fifth-degree black belt, earning himself the title Sabum, which translated means instructor. Hmm. He became a skilled teacher and a respected member of the martial arts community. A key word he used is structure. It's one of the, the most uh, incredible hmm. things to come from martial arts. And someone to achieve the height of fifth-degree black belt is quite an achievement yes. in life. Yes. In a grainy YouTube video preserved by Creekside Martial Arts shot at the 1993 BC ITF Provincial Championship, a focused Keith Black performs the moves included in the Chun Jang black belt pattern. Oh. There are a lot of moves to remember in yeah, a the, pattern. The man knows his stuff. Yeah. 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 After his first marriage failed, Keith moved to Kelowna to make a new start. He began teaching at a Taekwondo club he opened on the west side. Yeah. Rhonda, who would later become his wife, was also a Taekwondo practitioner. She took a lot of pride in her training, and one fellow student later commented that she was, quote, as strong as a male of the same size and weight. Oh, wow. Love of the martial arts ran in Rhonda's family, too. Her dad took up Kempo Karate at 51, Hans was a decent-sized man at 5'10 and weighed about 200 pounds. He loved sparring and fighting, especially with weapons. Knives were his favorite, and Hans always carried one. Leslie Poole, Hans' karate instructor in Oshawa, said, although he had started late, Hans was one of the best students she'd ever had, and he had achieved his black belt. So a black belt in karate yeah. is quite difficult to yeah. get. Uh, Mr. Herman did not like to compete. He would do it rarely and only in their small school, and was not good at competition. And that was the thing that scared me away from Taekwondo, was the competition aspect oh, of it. Oh, yeah? Because I, I liked martial arts. I wasn't big on performing it in front of somebody yeah, else, or yeah. having to stay within a certain list of rules to fight somebody. I think I could understand. I can, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. Ms. Poole, his martial arts instructor, emphasized respect, integrity, and humility as tenets of karate, and held Hans in high regard. So 
Well, this is like a family, uh, multiple family, two families yeah. of martial artists. Yeah, and you know, and and I love that Hans uh, didn't start until fifty. I think there's something to be said about approaching new passions in life late in life, like because, podcasting, like podcasting, <laughs> because you have a, your willingness to want to learn. Yeah, there's changes. a different kind of focus. Yes, yeah. it, it's it's not a well. I was told to do this, or I for it's more. A lot of decisions made in your late 40s, early 50s are because you want to. Yeah. Because the, not because you're pressured to or mm -hmm. that you want to. And so that it, there's a very significant difference in the learning that happens between forced and, and, and wanting. Hans Hermann was planning for his retirement from General Motors in Ontario in 1993. So in 1990, mm -hmm. He looked at buying a property in Kelowna and decided to move there with his wife, Annie, to live out their golden years in Lake Country after he called it quits at the car plant. I can, I can completely understand why. So their daughter, Rhonda, was also looking for a new beginning after divorcing her first husband. So Rhonda and Hans flew into Kelowna to go house shopping, and they found the perfect place. Rhonda could live there until her parents moved west three oh. years later. So great wow. setup. What a yeah, great setup. No you know? kidding. She can start to look for a place of her own. Get what she settled. did was buy some property and start to build a home of her own. Wow. Yeah. So after moving to BC, Rhonda needed a new school and a new teacher, and she found both and began training at Keith Black's school. Hmm. Keith appreciated Rhonda's enthusiasm and dedication to training. She was a real little spark plug and quickly became his favorite student. Rhonda enjoyed her teacher's attention. It didn't hurt that he was tall, fit, and mustachioed. She thought he was sexy. Well, They started dating almost right away, and in 1992, they got married. Rhonda, also a black belt, started teaching in Keith's school, and eventually they were running three different dojangs. Wow. This is really, so far, this is lovely. It sounds lovely. It sounds like it's, lovely. Yeah, yes. what a great... You've Everything's got, coming together for these yeah. two. The couple became a fixture in the Taekwondo community and traveled all over to participate in tournaments with their students, making friends as they went. The International Taekwondo Federation, the ITF, mm -hmm. it's quite an active martial arts federation. I There's imagine, stuff yeah. going on all the time. Yeah. Uh, I used to live with a third-degree Taekwondo black belt. And uh, he was always off at a different mm. event, training, mm. all those kind of things. It's probably one of the martial arts that I've seen people be the most dedicated to. Mm. It's fascinating, yeah. actually. By 1994, though, there was trouble in paradise. Oh, damn. Keith and Rhonda were fighting a lot, and money was always a big subject. Yeah. As it is in many marriages. Yes. They were building a log home on a piece of land that they'd bought, and... It was more expensive than their budget could handle. The Taekwondo schools were not as busy as either had liked. Mm. On top of that, Keith was drinking and gambling at casinos, and he was grumpy when he lost, and he lost a lot. Yeah. But the straw that broke the camel's back was that Keith was also running around on Rhonda. Okay, things are suddenly not so Not cheery. so fun. Yeah. Rhonda left Keith in May of 1994, she started an affair with another man in the Taekwondo community. She moved to Castlegar, B.C., mm -hmm. and into a home that her parents had bought for. Because Hans Hermann kind of didn't like Keith by this point. He uh, thought okay. he saw Keith as cocky yeah. and a guy who just thought, you know, the sun shone only on him yes, kind of yes. thing. So, And Hans was happy when the couple split. Yeah. They divided their assets and sold Rhonda's dream log home in the process. Rhonda filed for divorce and sought a restraining order. Oh, okay. She claimed that Keith would not leave her alone. She said he was calling day and night, and she also told people that he had threatened her more than once. Okay, so here we go. Yeah, things are looking yeah. sort of sketchy here. Yeah, I, I... <laughs> For some reason, known only to her, Rhonda finally realized that she didn't want to be without Keith. She begged to reconcile. Keith did take her back in March of 1995, but she later claimed that that's when he told her, quote, no one hurts me and gets away with it. 
Okay. Right? They bought a new home together on Sunview Drive in September 1995, closer to Rhonda's parents' home. The house had a main floor and an unfinished basement. Things, although still shaky, were looking up. Rhonda became pregnant and gave birth to a son in Mm. December of 1996. Okay. The marital strife had returned, too, and was in full force by early 1998. Rhonda claimed that Keith had begun to ignore her. She said they didn't have much of a relationship at all. Rhonda said Keith began to insult her and be rude to her in front of the students at the Taekwondo schools. When you separated with somebody uh, due to a lot of strife, yeah. One claims a lot of challenges, uh, you know, some threats. Uh, unless there's some serious therapy that's happened in the interim, yeah. getting back together, you're just oh, totally. going to end up with the same amount of strife. Like, unless you've resolved things. I can't remember where it was. It was maybe on a bad TV show or something. But someone said a bad relationship is like milk that's gone bad. You can't just yeah. put it in the fridge and take it out yeah. next week and think it's going to be Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good example. Rhonda claimed Keith had humiliated her at the provincial Taekwondo tournament in February of 1998 in Kelowna when he refused to introduce her along with the rest of the instructors. Mm. She believed that Keith resented her because she was spending most of her waking hours taking care of their infant son and had much less energy and time to devote to the Taekwondo schools. As you would. Yeah, yeah. you have a kid now. Right. That's good. Yes, a parent should put their priority towards said child. Rhonda said that outside Taekwondo tournaments, they never did things together as a family. She said they got into an argument about a bank account for the child. Each wished the other dead. And she claimed Mr. Black said to her, don't think yours can't be arranged. Yeah. It's always so difficult when you're having to take one person's uh, word for it. But uh, if that's accurate. Yeah, that's, that's not good. My God. Keith's old friend, Howard Stedman, was at the February tournament too. Keith and Howard, both into Taekwondo, had begun working out and sparring together when they both lived in Calgary years ago. Stedman had moved to Exshaw, Alberta, between Calgary and Banff, just east of Canmore, after Keith moved okay. to Kelowna. Yeah. They were hunting buddies. Stedman had introduced Keith to the sport, and Keith loved it. They went out whenever they could. Keith would sometimes go hunting alone and was not above bagging an elk or two when they were out of season. Uh-oh. After Keith married Rhonda, Stedman didn't see him as much, but they kept in touch, chatting in the phone often. Mm-hmm. Stedman had only been to the home the couple shared a couple of times. Keith invited Howard to come out to Kelowna to stay at the house again in the spring, and Stedman thought, oh, that's a great idea. I'll come out in the spring. As attendance at the Dojangs had dropped off, there was not enough cash to make ends meet. So Rhonda found Keith sitting on the floor despondent, asking himself why he couldn't keep his black belts. They were all quitting. Mm-hmm. perhaps because their teacher had become distracted and depressed with, you know, other things going on yeah, in his life. Yeah, and yeah. It's re- you're focused on getting your black belt. You want your teacher to be there for you. Absolutely. You want them to be focused on yeah. ensuring yeah. Y- you're going to be a successful. And so if he's not healthy, if he's, he's struggling yeah. at the time, yeah. then perhaps they didn't understand that and they would leave rather than say, yeah. hey, and there could be a Keith, little, you know, let's get you some help. Often, uh, as experienced, when you're depressed and suffering from mental illness and so on, you can get pretty cranky, right. despondent. Yeah, like, totally. you can be a pretty miserable person to be around. And so I can understand how that could chase people away. Yes. Keith was further distracted from his dojangs when he took a job at the Western Star truck plant to help to make ends meet. He'd work through the day and teach Taekwondo in the evenings. Having worked all day, he had less energy for his students. When Stedman showed up in the spring, Keith was acting kind of weird. He seemed distracted when he met Stedman at the airport. They went on a lengthy drive, and Stedman claimed that's when Keith asked him to kill Rhonda. So this is Stedman saying that? Yes. Okay. Stedman later said that Keith told him Rhonda was crazy and out of control. He had dreamt she was going to kill him. And Howard Stedman later claimed that he told Keith to do his own dirty work. Howard was angry and told Keith that if he was unhappy in his marriage, he should simply leave and get a divorce. Yes. You don't need to kill your wife. Correct. 
Stedman took the opportunity of a trip to the store with Rhonda to tell her what Keith had said. Your old man's going nuts because he just asked me to kill you. And Howard said he was sure that it was all talk, though, that Keith didn't really want her dead. But if things were nasty, he said, quote, why don't you pick up your shit and get out of here? And he left the next day. Okay, so I struggle with knowing what good comes from telling the other person that their partner wants to kill them. What you do is you tell the authorities. Yeah. You don't say, like... My friend asked me to kill his wife. Yeah, but... but at the same time... He said that he's he... has got a good you know, friendship with this person. I'm not saying it's right yeah. what he did, but he probably thought this was the path of least resistance and the one that would ensure that... Maybe things could be reconciled. Oh, Perhaps I, that was sure. What was in yeah, I, I, you know, and it's easy to say what you would do if you're not in that situation. But my my thoughts went to well, no, you know, like telling two people who are clashing that the other one wants to kill them, like that's just going to make things more intense. It's not going to calm anything down. So go to the goddamn authorities. Let them sort it out. In July of that year, when the Western Star plant was on a brief plan shutdown, Keith called Howard. Okay, going to call your buddy, get mm -hmm. stuff, you know. Keith said he was going to the Calgary Stampede. Oh, yeah. On his way back, he would drop in on Howard. Sure, sure yeah. Sounds good. He was going on his own. Rhonda was staying home. Yeah. Keith never showed, but called Howard saying he was in Nelson, British Columbia, visiting a woman named Carolyn, whom he had met through Taekwondo. Keith asked Howard to cover for him if Rhonda called. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Howard said he would, to, and when Rhonda telephoned, he lied to her about where Keith was and what he was doing. The thing about all this is, is that years later, when asked about it, Carolyn would deny entirely that she ever had a physical relationship with Keith. The reason for Stedman making these claims will become clear later on. Oh, jeez. This yeah. just gets uglier it's, it's and uglier. Messy. Keith did arrive at Howard's place on July 12th and visited for about an hour. And during that time, Keith complained about his financial problems and his marriage. And that was the last time Mr. Stedman saw Mr. Black mm. alive. Mm -hmm. Over the next couple of weeks, Howard spoke with Rhonda on the telephone. Rhonda continued to express concerns that Keith may have a contract out on her life. Howard has told Rhonda yep. that Keith wants to kill her, so now she's worried about it. Well, and that's part of the challenge is when mm. you tell the other person that is that they're going to yes, think that's real. Absolutely. I if you told me that Joanna wants me uh, dead, yeah, I'm this going to be a pretty consuming. I probably just wouldn't tell you. <laughs> Because it would make for a great episode. You, you'd probably say, no, and I how can I help? I shouldn't joke about that. But but it you're going to. I would be just consumed with nothing. Everything that yeah. I do is like, oh, shit, is there somebody yeah. here to kill me? Over the course of those calls, though, Rhonda suggested twice that Howard kill Keith. Howard claimed mm -hmm. that he did not take her seriously the first time, but when she asked the second time, he knew that she meant what she was saying. Mm. Again... Howard told Rhonda that she should just leave Keith and offered her a place to stay while she was in transition. There's never been any proof of this, but I'm wondering if there was a bit oh, of a... waka waka? Well, some sort of triangle yeah. happening. Yeah. It could have been an emotional one. There might not have been a physical thing happening, yeah. but there could have been this emotional thing going on. There's, yeah, there's, there's different degrees of unfaithfulness, right? What I can say with confidence is... Uh, this trio of people have terrible conflict resolution skills. Oh, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> Keith returned to work at Western Star on Monday, July 13th, 1998. He taught his Taekwondo classes that week. Carolyn, the woman Stedman claimed Keith had stopped to see on his way back from Calgary, drove over from Nelson and spent the night at Keith and Rhonda's place on Friday, July 17th, 1998. Carolyn had to pick up her mother, who was flying into Kelowna on Saturday. Rhonda had no idea. It is unclear if Rhonda had any idea about Keith's supposed visit with Carolyn only days previous. But she may have become suspicious about her husband and Carolyn when seeing him interact with the pretty young Taekwondo instructor. 
Carolyn remembered that Rhonda was not feeling well that weekend and stayed in her bedroom and was ill in bed for most of Carolyn's visit. Okay. Rhonda remembers this a very different way. She's thinking, no, Carolyn never stayed here. There's there's a lot of things like that... the exact opposite of what's being stated. Right, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. The two women spoke only briefly, according to Carolyn. Carolyn went downstairs to the basement that evening with Keith. He kept his equipment and trophies there, and he said he wanted to show her something, although she didn't recall what. Carolyn saw a mattress there, but couldn't recall if there was bedding. She said she slept on a couch in the family room, and she did not see where Keith slept. It was apparent things were tense, though, between him and Rhonda. Hmm. Carolyn and Keith trained together the next morning, and they went their separate ways. She went to the airport and picked up her mother and spent two weeks traveling with her. So that's the last time she sees Keith alive. What this is just a very bizarre situation. It gets weirder. So like I'm wondering if Rhonda wasn't te- uh, or sorry, if Keith wasn't telling Caroline, well here's what Rhonda's in there and she's sick and she's not coming out. That's why Rhonda and Caroline have very different stories. Yeah, there's it's like the truth is very difficult in this yeah, one. Yeah. Because the stories of the people left over. Obviously, Keith yeah. is not around to tell the story. We mentioned that in the yep. show's title. Yep. Uh, he's not around to defend what's being told. Yep. But the stories are, in the court documents, they refer to multiple levels of hearsay. Yeah. And it's I all get conflicting. Yeah. yeah, I get that sense, yeah. So maybe that's why this story didn't get a lot of attention in the press, because it's difficult. It, you know, a lot of stories are told in the press, in in, in media, with you having a clear saw, n- knowledge of who's good and who's bad. It's well, easier to tell stories like that. And so when you have well, the one... The way this is told yeah. in the press... It is. It paints things one way. Hey, they do, eh? Oh, absolutely, yeah. they do. But there's, there's a lot more twists and turns mm-hmm. to this, and I implore you folks to read the link that I will post in the show notes to the court document that is very, very long mm-hmm. and explains this whole thing because I could have done four episodes on this show. Oh, alone. Wow, eh? Yeah, on this topic alone. Shit. There's a book here. Yeah, really, there is. Shit. Keith showed up for his job at Western Star Trucks on July 20th, 1998, right on time at 6.50 a.m. Supposed to be there 10 minutes before work, and he was there 10 minutes before work. From court documents, Ms. Bure, the personnel manager at Western Star who knew Keith Black through Taekwondo, had helped him to get the job at the truck manufacturing plant. She waved to him as he left work on Monday and said that was the last time she saw him. Mr. Hmm. Duty... Keith's supervisor at Western Star said Black worked from 7 a.m. to the 3.30 p.m. shift. So him walking away from his job is the last time anyone else sees him alive other than the person or persons who killed him, Mm -hmm. as far as we're aware. Mm -hmm. Keith was not at the dojang to lead class in that evening. Leah Wary, a trusted student working hard toward her black belt, stepped up and taught session. When Keith didn't show up for work the next day, Duty told personnel to call and see if Keith was okay. And there was no answer at the Mm -hmm. black resident. And we'll take a break right here. And we're back. And so what do you think so far, Scott? Confusion. Right? Confusion. Um... What's happening? I love it when I can pick a side clearly and easily, and I'm always a, a supporter of victims. And so, um, I'm I'm a supporter of victim. Yeah, in so this it's, case, it's as just well. but, but it sounds like it's really hard to ascertain what's hearing what I've heard so far. What the truth who, is? Who's the victim? Like it's clear. Uh, the, uh, the, unless we had a different title for the show, you wouldn't know who the victim was going to be. No, exactly. And even knowing what happened, you know, I do have a sense that well, okay, maybe this was somebody who was abused and then just finally fought. But it's so it's difficult to you know, yep, to really kind of pinpoint. Keith Black was not showing up for work over the next few days. Sometime mid morning on Friday, July twenty fourth, nineteen ninety eight, Ms. Bure called to ask about his whereabouts and spoke to Rhonda. Mm -hmm. 
Rhonda said that Keith was sick. Okay. Ms. Bure said, okay, Keith has to call the sick line and gave her the number and uh, told her Keith needs to call or he'll lose his job. Mm -hmm. Keith never called. So, yeah, Keith's where's not Keith? Around. Where's Keith? Keith? Keith's not around. From court documents. Also on Friday, July 24th, 1998, in the early afternoon, an old friend, Mike Boisgelet, dropped in unexpectedly to vi visit Keith and Rhonda Black while his wife, Hillary, was in town at a conference. He testified he tried to phone but could not get through. He said Rhonda was sitting on the front lawn with the child and seemed happy to see him and was not nervous or anxious. She told Mr. Boisgelet that Keith was not at home and had maybe gone hunting, and she had to lie to Western Star about it when they had phoned. Mike assumed from the context that Western Star had called that morning. Mm -hmm. Mr. Boisgelet said they visited and chatted for an hour or so, and Rhonda showed him the landscaping she was doing. Rhonda told Mike the phone had been disconnected and mentioned troubles with money. Mm. The phone was fine. Mm. No one had seen Keith Black in a week, and folks were starting to ask about him. Yeah. Work, students, family, friends, everybody, where's Keith? What happened to him? No kidding. Rhonda began telling people that Keith had gone hunting. She talked to Ms. Bure at Western Star Trucks on July 27th. This is a, a week after he's last seen there. Rhonda said that she'd been afraid to get him in trouble as it was not hunting season. And so that's why she had lied about him being sick. Personnel had termination papers drawn up for Keith by the next day. Because, well, looks yeah. like our employee's lying to us about where he is. Yeah. So and, and we're just going to terminate him in absentia. We have gone through that scenario when we worked in management. At, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But, you know. Sandy Krause, Keith's sister, was worried about her brother. Yeah. Rhonda kept to the Keith has gone hunting scenario, but something didn't feel right. Sandy urged Rhonda to contact police and tried filing a missing persons report herself. Rhonda told Sandy that Keith had changed recently. Rhonda said... Keith was acting strangely. He was taking pills, drinking, and shaving his genitals. She also told Sandy that they did not sleep together anymore. Keith would come home, have a nap downstairs where it was cooler, before going to teach his class. Their paths did not cross, and she could not remember when she last saw him. Wow, how uh, convenient. So... That's what that mattress may have been downstairs, you know? They're, yeah. They're maybe yeah. fighting. He's just decided that's where I'm going to sleep. Who knows? Uh, From court records, quote, During the next few weeks, Mr. and Mrs. Kraus and their son Kirk visited Rhonda Petra Black, worried over where Keith was. Yeah. The Krauses took Rhonda a hamper of food. You know, her and her son are sitting at home alone, worried about where her husband is. Rhonda told them that Keith had abandoned her, and she did not know what to do. They described her demeanor as varying from hysterical crying to rage over having been left alone with a child and no money. But still not contacting the authorities. No. What? Um... Kirk Krause, Sandy's son, said he brainstormed with Rhonda about where Keith could be. They discussed the possibility of hunting, but although Kirk knew Keith would hunt animals out of season, he didn't think that Keith would go hunting in the summer because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. It's not the time. The animals aren't in the shape that you want to be. Yeah, and, yeah. and to be in absolutely no contact with your son at the least. Yeah, with your, your baby son. Yeah. Rhonda told Kirk that Keith's prized Browning rifle was missing. She also said that Keith had been binging and taking drugs, but Kirk had never seen indications of Keith abusing drugs or alcohol, and he found Rhonda's claims baffling. At that point, Kirk Kraus asked Rhonda if he could go through Keith's camping and hunting gear in the basement, as he didn't want them to go to auction. Mm -hmm. She was just going to give them away mm -hmm. already. Rhonda said she was too upset to do that, so Kirk didn't push it. Kirk said he had gone downstairs and noted the basement had been rearranged and was very clean, which was out of the mm. ordinary. Receipts later showed that Rhonda had rented a rug cleaner the week before. 
Over the next week, she was already talking to realtors and selling Keith's weightlifting and other training equipment from the basement. Yeah, my true crime senses are tingling. Right. On August 3rd, 1998, this is less than two weeks since he's gone missing, well, about two weeks, Keith's Hyundai, sitting abandoned on a back road near Tappan, British Columbia, was finally reported to police by locals. Mm. The RCMP towed it and called Rhonda and left a message. Hey, we found your husband's car. Yeah, because as far as the RCMP are aware at this moment, he's not. there's no missing person. As other people have tried to report him missing. Mm. Rhonda has not. Yeah. Rhonda called back the next day and said Keith had abandoned her and her child three weeks before. And she was anxious to speak to the officer who left the message and hoped he had some information on her husband's disappearance. This conversation was the first contact Rhonda had with the cops related to Keith's vanishing, despite others expressing their concerns and begging her to do so. Mm-hmm. On August 17th, Rhonda filed for divorce from Keith stating that his whereabouts were unknown. So less than a month after your husband disappears, you're filing for divorce. I'm trying my damnedest to be objective and say, well, let's say that that, I think her name was Caroline. Things have kind of tipped over, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Things are tipping for you now. Well, I'm still trying to be objective, though. Like, okay, well, what if Caroline, I think that was her name, what if she did something and killed him because she was jealous, and then you've got... Uh, Rhonda, like, who's been, you know, from her perspective, abused and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, just bitter and angry and like, good, well, I don't care. Get him the hell out of my, like, I'm trying to see like, well, how can I not just blindly go? Yeah, Rhonda did it. On September 3rd, 1998, Rhonda commenced an action in the Supreme Court of British Columbia under the Divorce Act and Family Relations Act for custody child and spousal support and reappointment of the family assets so everything would be in her name. Convenient. Rhonda was interviewed various times by the police who were trying to learn if Keith had simply disappeared on his own, died by suicide, which was the first theory of his sister, Sandy, or he had met some harm. Rhonda continued to maintain that she had been abandoned and had no knowledge of her husband's whereabouts. Cops were talking to other folks, too, though. There was a lot of conflicting information about what was going on in the blacks' relationship. I you don't say. Including another man who claimed that Rhonda had asked him to murder Keith two months prior. Oh, shit. RCMP brought Rhonda in for a formal interview on September 9, 1998. So this is less than two months after Keith goes missing. During the interview... Sergeant Strader asked Rhonda, what if I told you that police have a crime stopper tip that you approached a person to have Keith killed? Mm. Rhonda said, quote, yeah, I'd say that was true. There was a time I can tell you his name, who I approached, and I could be quite frank that I was so mad when he was treating me like shit and he was treating our son like shit. I said to him, I'd be better off if he were dead, if I knew someone. And he says, I do know someone. He gave me some ideas on how to do it. And I says, I can't do it. I can't. So this guy was telling her that he knew bikers and that he could get bikers to do it for her. Oh, and there's something to admitting it that makes it easier to believe. But then there's also, it could just be her trying to get ahead of the story. Mm-hmm. You know. RCMP continues to press Rhonda on details of Keith's disappearance, and she gets more and more frustrated and upset as the interview goes on. And when asked why she was so upset, she said, quote, Do you want to know why I'm flustered when you ask me these questions? Do you want to know why? And since I have, I've been honest with you the whole time, look, I could have come in here and lied. I could have said nothing, okay? The reason I'm flustered is because I had no reason to doubt him. I had no reason to question him. I had no reason to think anything was up. Come on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come on. Cops had zero physical evidence linking Rhonda to any kind of foul play at this point. Yeah, yeah. Rhonda asked if she could leave. She was told she could, as she had not been arrested. Arrested. Rhonda walked out of the detachment with her son and drove off. 
She was under surveillance for a time afterward. She was acting strangely, but she didn't give herself away, initially at least. It's quite the dilly of a pickle we got going Right, here. exactly. Jesus. Now, in the meantime, the police have not looked at the evidence. Yep. They haven't gone into the basement of the house yep. where... You know, other people are saying something's different down there. And we know the magic luminol can do. The house gets sold. Yeah. The people who buy the house rip the all the stuff out of the basement and reconfigure. Yeah. Oh, shit. So the basement is now a different place. Yeah. I'm curious as to why the police didn't. Great was question. it just challenging to get a search warrant? Because you have no evidence? you have no evidence. You yeah. have to have evidence for a search yeah. warrant. Sandy Krause, Keith's sister, was the one who kept the investigation going. She kept pestering the cops, asking whether there was any progress in finding out what happened to her brother, Keith. She knew Rhonda was acting sketchy. The police were tight-lipped, though, so out of frustration, Sandy began her own investigation. Mm -hmm. She started talking to people. Over the next few years, she started finding things out about Keith that she didn't want to know. Okay. In a later article published by the Morning Star newspaper, Sandy spoke out about her efforts to find her brother. I spoke to Rhonda quite often, she said. My husband and I went down to see her and listened to everything she said, and then I thought, that's not how my brother saw it. Uh, Sandy would then discuss with her family the inconsistencies in what Keith had told them about his relationship with his wife, gambling problems, affairs, and money troubles, and then she would try to find answers, either from the police or from her own interviews. Quote, I believe the RCMP was feeding me bits of information to keep me happy without feeding me the important stuff I could not know, she said. You have to understand I was persistent. I phoned weekly for a long time and once a month for five years. I wanted to know where my brother was. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if he was dead. I wanted to know what happened, Mm -hmm. end quote. Of course, I would want to know all those things too. If something happened to you, like, I know we're not a couple, but if some <laughs> if something happened to you, I would definitely be pestering people to yeah, let's find yeah. out what happened to Scott. Yeah. Let's find out because yeah. I need to I need to know what happened to Scott so I can do a show. At least give it a solid <laughs> week pestering. At least <laughs> Sandy wrote everything down in her diary. Also from the same Morning Star article, she found that quote Keith was having an affair with the girl in Nelson. And with another woman in Calgary. Mm. He was heavily in debt, some $57,000 by her Mm. calculation. That's a chunk. And that didn't include gambling debts that she kept hearing about. So he owed other people money Mm -hmm. for the gambling. Mm -hmm. She wrote that Keith was losing respect in the Taekwondo community for missing classes and then getting into a fight with a girlfriend at a meet. She wrote that Keith took home a sexually transmitted disease. She admitted she knew he was a poacher and even involved her young son in stealing marked logs for firewood. There was also a bizarre notion about Keith shaving his head and genitals about which she wrote, strange for a 38-year-old man. Krauss said she told police once that she, quote, wouldn't be surprised if Keith got into some trouble with the law that might have spooked him. She told them he wouldn't hesitate to screw you if he could. She also noted that, quote, I sometimes get the feeling that he was trying to force Rhonda to leave because he couldn't, end quote. So (sighs) even his own sister is Uh, finding, like, maybe he has actually taken off. Maybe he's gone. Maybe he's taken off somewhere. Uh, Maybe he was spooked by these folks who he owed money to. Yeah, just I want to clear the slate, start over. The heat was on kind of thing. Maybe. Unknown to Sandy, though. The cops were working on another angle of their own. Uh, Their favorite long game undercover sting. Oh, here we go. Mr. Big. Oh, man. And Rhonda was the target. Yeah. The operation started in October 2001. After romancing her for two years in a conversation with an undercover operator known as Jay, Rhonda finally admitted that she knew what had happened to Keith. Boy, they're really playing the long game. That's a two-year sting. <laughs> Some of them are, the, are that long. My Lord. From court documents, Ms. Black said that Mr. Black was sleeping, taking an afternoon nap in the basement on a foam mattress on the concrete floor. Jay asked, So when you went downstairs, he's sleeping? Rhonda said, He's sleeping. Jay then asks, 
And what's like, how do you do it like? Rhonda said, I just walked up to him and everything just kind of left me. It was like the next thing I know, I don't even remember doing it. I remember standing over him thinking, this is nuts, this is crazy, like, no, I can't. And the next thing I know, it's like nothing existed. I didn't exist, the room didn't exist, he didn't exist, nothing existed. Hmm. Next thing I know, the reality is, like, I snapped out of the zone, and he was grabbing his throat. And he's like, what the, whatever he said, and what the heck, or whatever, he realized what happened. I realized, holy shit. I did it. Like, oh my God, I was just standing there going, oh my God, it's not reality. Like, what the hell's going on? He stumbled around. He picked this bar. I don't know if it was made of wood or metal. And he went to hit at me. He cut my leg open. He said, you bitch. He staggered, fell down and convulsed and stopped. And in the meantime, I was freaking out. I was just praying. I was like, oh my God, I just... Yeah, just freaking. And Jay says, How long did you leave him there before you? Rhonda said, I don't know. I felt like it was only minutes. I was praying and praying and praying and ran upstairs and phoned Howard right away. And I just said, Oh my God, it's done, you know? He didn't say anything and he knew. And I said, I don't know what to do. Like I was ready to phone the police right then and just say, take me away, but all I could think of is our son. Rhonda had stabbed Keith to death as he slept. Shit. On Rhonda's phone call to Howard, she told him she was bringing him a package. In his later statement, Howard said that he replied, you didn't. And she said, yes, I did. Howard gave everything up to the undercover operators, too, including the multiple locations of Keith's remains. Oh, Rhonda was freaked out when she showed up at Howard's place, her son in tow. She opened the trunk, and there was Keith's body wrapped in something. She wanted Howard to help her get rid of the body. Howard threw a hatchet and a shovel into the trunk along with the body. Howard Stedman drove them to Spray Lake. Rhonda's son was in the car the whole time. They went to a place that he and Keith used to hunt, and Stedman said, I think this place looks kind of pretty. There, he said he watched as Rhonda chopped off Keith's hands and head with the hatchet and the knife that she had brought. Everyone who's watched a crime show knows that's the way gangsters cover up a body's identity. They put the head and hands in a plastic bag and buried Keith's body in a shallow grave there in near Spray Lake. From court documents, quote, On the way down from the mountains... Ms. Black wanted to dispose of the head and hands over any number of embankments as they drove by. Mr. Stedman convinced her otherwise. They returned to his house where she put the tarp that she had been using to wrap Mr. Black's body and his hands in Mr. Stedman's fire pit that had been burning in the yard. (sighs) While Ms. Black was having a shower, Mr. Stedman removed the hands from the fire pit because they wouldn't burn. When she finished her shower, they decided to go to another location in the mountains, again selected by Mr. Stedman, to dispose of the head and hands. Mr. Stedman took his loaded shotgun with him. They arrived in an area near a gravel pit, and Ms. Black dug a hole. After putting the head in the hole, she wanted Mr. Stedman to shoot it with the shotgun. He fired five or six rounds, but not at the head, although in a way that would lead Ms. Black to believe that he had. They buried the head and proceeded back toward Exshaw. En route, they stopped on a bridge where Ms. Black threw the hands, the hatchet, and the knife into the river below. They returned to Mr. Stedman's house, and he went to bed. When he awoke the next day, Ms. Black and her son were gone. I'm curious as to why she wanted him to shoot the head and why he didn't. I'm thinking that she wanted any identifiable... It it would uh, destroy the... She said to shoot the teeth specifically. And then I wonder why he didn't. It was either he felt guilty because it's his friend friend. or he felt maybe like, oh, is she going to try to incriminate me? If she goes down now, she's got something against me that I I shot him first and that's what killed... You know? Huh? Wow. Mr. Stedman later testified that he called Ms. Black after a few days to check on the child. And he arranged to hide Mr. Black's car, which they abandoned on a road near Sycamus. 
He said when driving Ms. Black back to Kelowna, he told her that if anything happened to the kid, he'd knock her head in with a stick. So he was probably concerned for the ch- She's murdered I, once. I would understand why he would be concerned. Mm-hmm. Rhonda Petra Black was arrested in 2003 and tried for Keith Black's murder in 2007. At her trial, she tried to throw her now-deceased father under the bus, saying he was Keith's real killer, that she had lied in her confession to Jay. Really? Yeah, her mother and her both testified that that Rhonda's father had admitted to killing Keith, and uh, yeah, it was it was very ugly. Rhonda and her mother. Her mother. Yeah. Well. Wow. Dad's dead. What's it going to oh, hurt now, right? God. Other than a reputation. Well, and if you're willing to commit murder. Hmm. So she's found guilty anyway of second degree murder and given life with ten years before she could be eligible for parole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, obviously Sandy Krause thought that she should be going away for first-degree murder for much longer. Yes. But because she had contemplated it before, but she gave this, oh, I didn't know what I was doing and all that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, I, I, w- I was in a trance-like state. and Aren't they always? Yeah. Howard Stedman was charged with this accessory after the fact of murder, and he was found guilty at his 2008 trial mm-hmm. from Castanet, calling it a ghoulish act... Mr. Justice Jeffrey Barrow sentenced Howard Stedman to four years in prison. Howard appealed his sentence, but it was denied. So you got four years for your part in just getting rid of a body. But there was more to it because he knew about each other's plans to. Yeah. And, you know, part like. Who knows if Keith ever said that to Stedman? Do you know what I mean? Like, who knows if Keith ever told him, I think Rhonda's going to kill me. So will you kill me for her? Or, Who knows if or, that's true? Or if he just said it to try to give it's some all, defense to Rhonda. There's a lot of subterfuge and yeah. weirdness going on in this. In yeah, this. yeah, yeah. And in the trial transcripts, in the court documents that I'm going to post a link to, people will see there's more, multiple layers of this. Good and it would have been God. such a confusing podcast had I included everything. Yeah. Um, but it is really fascinating. Wow. Rhonda Petra Black was given day parole in 2016. Oh, she liked. From a Kelowna Now news article, quote, you now accept full responsibility for your index offense. However, the report indicates you continue to minimize your dismemberment of the victim's body with the assistance of the co-accused. Reads the decision that also points out that Black claims to be sickened by the crimes she's been convicted of. An institutional parole office worker who has been with Rhonda Black during her rehabilitation said that she's seen positive changes over the last couple of years. Quote, you're a person who previously shut down and did not accept negative information, reads the decision. The parole officer then said, you have consistently demonstrated improved interaction and now are less rigid. So, you know, she's able to, to, yeah. An institutional... Uh, parole officers, institutionalized parole officers, they do spend a lot of time. They, they're in there every day. It's their nine to five and they're meeting with these individuals daily. So I do put a lot of weight behind what they're mm-hmm. seeing because it's not like a weekly check-in. Yeah, They're embedded with these people in many regards. So the quote ends with, of note, Black has, quote, a greater capacity for change and has, quote, stopped living with secrets. So she's admitted that it was her Mm -hmm. and taken responsibility for what's going on. So Yeah, good. Um, But holy crap, what a crazy case. What a... There's so many twists and turns and ups and downs. Right. Holy crap. And to know that there's, like, way more... Yeah. ...in the court documents. Like, my God. Yeah. Wow, what a fascinating case. Yeah. Uh, Somebody should make a podcast about it. Somebody just did. Look at that. (laughs) I don't know where I came across that case. I can't remember if somebody sent it to me. I would imagine some. This seems like one that somebody would send. No, I've I've gone through my Gmail and it doesn't seem like anybody sent it, so... Weird. I may have misplaced it. I don't know. But, well, I'm glad it's here. But I've got a, like a really, really long list. And yes. when I was looking at what's what's next after the one that we just did, this one really stood out as one that needed to be told. Oh, it's so fascinating. Yeah. 
I guess it's time for voicemails now. Oh, boy. Okay. Hopefully we have no weird twists and turns in our voicemails, <laughs> and, and they are just straight-up praise and love like, oh, uh, like we usually get. Fingers so crossed. So 99.9% yes. so far. Yes, a good percentage. <laughs> oh, boy. And, uh, oh, we're back to watching hockey, too, and the Canucks are moving on. I know. I watched... Uh, I watched some hockey. I I actually watched the Canucks, and that was exciting. Right? That was exciting. I, I watched the first game, and I'm like, oh, shit, this is what I remember. Yeah. And then it was just like, no, okay, look at them go. Yeah, they really did well. They really did. And yesterday's game, the you know, game uh, four, they really, like, they, you know, had a lot of adversity. They were down a lot behind a lot, just kept pushing and pushing. It was great. Okay, so this first one is really short, and we're going to listen to it just for fun, but I don't know if we'll actually use it in the show. Yeah. Well, hello, Mikey Scott. This is Gandalf the Grey. I am calling on behalf of trying the great Doc Poutine. It has finally landed here in Middle Earth. Please keep up the fine work. And have a wonderful day. Wow! So Gandalf the Grey just gave us a call. Yeah, again, this is a wonderful example of translate. Yeah. In this, yeah, app. it's it did none of it. Gandalf even... was not mentioned. No. And so, yeah, I I much prefer the voicemail. I prefer the what voicemail I read. To, to what I read as yeah, well. That's yeah. why I kind of gave it a shot because you, you I had did, a yeah. funny feeling yeah. it was going to be a weird one. And it was. It was good. It was an excellent weird one. I'm really stoked to get that Gandalf listens. Right? Uh, you know, I was hoping that that famous wizards from Middle Earth might be listening to us. I know. You're always saying that. It's, it's, it's just a dream of mine. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And, and look what's just come true. Yeah, we have Gandalf the Grey. Uh, so I'm let's... kind of sad it wasn't Gandalf the White. Mm, I know. And, and I'm really glad it wasn't Sauron. Oh, so, uh, well, that's not going to end well for yeah. us. So let this be a lesson to all of you listeners up there. Never give up on your dreams. Never give up on your dreams. They and can come uh, true. And uh, what, as they say it in Goodfellas, never rat, always keep your mouth shut and never rat on your friends. Aren't they the same thing? It's well, the same thing. It's the same thing. It sounds like exactly the same It's thing. the same thing. But, uh, okay, so Gandalf the Grey. Well, there you go. Thank uh, you, Gandalf. Well, how can we how can we do better after that? I mean... it's a great question. You know what? Um, people do send, call us and give us love, though. So uh, let's, let's listen to some of this. Sure. Oh, this one looks like it's from Saskatchewan. Oh, Saskatchewan. Hi there. Uh, I'm uh, a relatively new listener to your show. Uh, I'm from Saskatchewan, and I just wanted to say uh, how much I enjoy listening to your guys' show. Uh, I'm originally from uh, Saskatoon, but uh, moved to Regina for work. I didn't know a lot about the city when I moved, even though I'm from the province. So hearing you guys' stuff covering like the Colin Thatcher story and everything like that, despite the fact that I've driven past that house hundreds of times uh was really a really good and important story to hear uh i got on the podcast uh after my tattoo artist actually recommended it to me i'd been listening to a, a lot of other shows but uh it's always great to actually hear a show that's 100 percent canadian and covers canadian content uh it's i think it's really important for everybody to hear all the stories that you guys are telling and from such a compassionate standpoint as well. And I just wanted to thank you guys for all your hard work. So from uh, one of the smaller <laughs> provinces, the one with the hard name that's easy to draw, I just want to say thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> hard name that's easy to that's one of my favorite yeah uh, things about easy to draw uh, referring to saskatchewan i've heard that a few times yeah, and uh, i've never heard that it's got a hard name but it's easy to draw yeah. <laughs> so yeah, true hey you know what um we don't look at any province as lesser than we re we really don't i uh unless in drawing sense Unless it's in a drawing sense. I, I have probably have trouble drawing Ontario. Yeah. A little bit. To back a bit. Uh, yeah, a little bit. But uh but yeah, I mean, I love all our Canadian stories. I don't really care where they're from, to tell you the truth. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it our country is beautiful. <laughs> 
I but, just spent some time in it. I'm still currently spending time in it. But right. I just, you know, just did a little bit of driving. And yeah, it, it, wherever you're from, we love you. Exactly. Um, let's, oh, look, this is another one from Saskatchewan. Very weird. On? Goodness gracious. All these Saskatchewanese. Looks like they had a convention or something. Saskatchewaners? I don't know what, is, what they are. Sketch, Saskatchewan? Saskatchewans. Saskatchewans? Yeah, Saskatchewans. Let's, let's give it a shot. Hey guys, Dawson calling from Swift Current, Saskatchewan. Uh, just a couple hours down the road from your latest case, which was Dylan Koshman. Um, if you hear any noise in the background, I'm in the tractor cutting green seed for our cattle, but uh, I just wanted to say thanks for all the work you guys do and keeps me entertained in these long, long hours. Um, you guys are awesome, and if you have any inkling of what's happened in Swift Current recently with the uh, with the Logan Ring case, um, I'd really love to hear about that in the show because there's a lot of loose ends that aren't tied up yet. Um, anyways, you guys are awesome, and uh, please, please go take a shit in your hat. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Dawson. I uh, love it when uh, people who are doing farm work call us because, you know what? You guys are the salt of the earth. Yeah, you I, really, really are. What I don't like about it is I, I recognize how goddamn lazy, lazy we are. We are. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's like, no, this man's out there working he's actually, probably like 12 he, hours. He's doing a real work. And we just blather. Lifting shit, bales of hay. He's got about, moves like, files around. Yeah. Pretty much all on day. On a computer. Um, watches TV. Yeah, on a computer. Yeah. Uh, and in I a write chair. things. Yeah. Like. Wow, no, you're the real salt of this earth. Right. Yeah. We're, we, we're just occupying. We're just, yeah, we're just taking up space, really. Wow. Yeah. So thank you for listening. All right, that's it for our voicemails for this week. Uh, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 If your call really stands out, you might hear it on the show. If it doesn't, you won't. Yeah, and... Uh, <laughs> Deal with it. Deal with, well, whatever it is you have to deal with, make sure yeah, that you're dealing. Just deal with it. Just lots of dealing. There is, there's plenty of dealing yeah, happening. As there should be. You know, in this current climate, a whole we lot of in. dealing going on. We need some dealing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm worried when we're not dealing because when we're not dealing, we're, we're, uh, Undeal, we're anti deal. We're yeah. anti dealing with And whatever. we're not, we don't want to be anti dealing. We no. We're pro dealing. Exactly. So let's see, and then we'll do, all right. So I guess it's time for Patreon shoutouts. So yeah. that would mean that I should open the site, the Patreon site, so we can actually look and well, see who, who provided us with love. That, that would be one the, way to do it. it yeah, or we, actually, I could just do it off the top of my head because yeah, I, I do get you, the emails. I think you memorize at all. I actually do not. You have every single Patreon. I have there. trouble memorizing <laughs> where the bathroom is in my own <laughs> home. Uh, yeah. So, uh, first up for patrons, we mm -hmm. have Kim Dubay ah, from Dubai. Gatineau, Quebec. Oh, good old Gatineau. What does Kim do in Gatineau? What Kim does mm -hmm. is she likes, she's, she makes homemade uh, lawn chairs. Homemade lawn chairs. Out of a solid piece of wood. So, oh, wow. I know. Th that is doable. It is. It, Does she do it with a chainsaw? Doesn't seem like the most efficient way. Uh, she incorporates the chainsaw, mm. but it's not 100% chainsaw. Well, thanks, Kim. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. So thank you for uh, taking time from your creation of single block lawn chairs. Exactly. I guess, is it singleblocklawnchairs.ca? Oh. It probably it is probably such a site. Probably is that. Yeah. yeah, we're not advertising for that site. Yeah. If there is actually, unless one. it's yours. Yeah, exactly. And then we are. Next up, we have from Vancouver, oh. British Columbia, a little place that we know and love. I've heard about it. Her name is Sarah Jasper. Sarah Jasper. Thank you, Sarah. What does Sarah do for uh, a living? She's a juicer. Like, uh, so she she takes steroids. That's exactly what she does. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say like she works no, at Jamba no. Juice or she something like that. She takes steroids and or provides steroids. 
Oh, wow. Yes. That's what they call You know, them. that's illegal. Well, Whereas we're saying that somebody is doing something illegally. Well, then she should stop advertising it on Craigslist. Uh, that's not really what she does. Oh. Scott's making that up, just so you know. If the RCMP are listening, this is all a ruse. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for not doing something illegal for a living. Maybe she's a doctor and she's prescribing them. I mean, you know, I didn't, I didn't. Also illegal. Uh, next up, we have from Richland, Washington. Right, Richland, yeah. Lauren Eikenberry. Oh. I like that name, Eikenberry. Sounds delicious. <laughs> It's Frankenberry. I love a bowl full of Eikenberries. Hmm. Is it a cereal? Like I don't know. Uh, it's a, thank you, Lauren. What yeah. does Lauren do in Richland? Lauren is a roof painter. Well, not, she paints roofs. Yeah, it's not what you think, though. Okay. She doesn't like, it's not the exterior, only interior roofs. But she'll paint your ceiling. So then it's not a roof, it's a ceiling, because yeah. the roof is on the exterior depends of your on, house. Yeah, it depends. If you're on top of it, it's a roof, isn't it? No, mm -hmm. it's then it would be the floor mm -hmm. that's above. Mm -hmm. look, look, let's just let's, not let's argue just semantics, support right? her. Let's just support her. Correct. And her roof painting. Well, thank you, Lauren. Yeah. Continue it, painting roofs. Yeah. If you want your wall painted, though, you're fresh out of luck. Fresh out of it's luck. Just roof. Fresh out of paint. Specifically. <laughs> next we have. Next we have from St. Louis, Missouri, oh. where the Stanley Cup currently resides. If mm. I am correct. I don't know. Uh, Anne Broad. Or Annie. Annie. Yeah. I, I like to say Annie, although it's not how it's pronounced. But I like to say it. She well. gets mad at me. She's oh, like, okay. My name's not fucking Annie. Okay. And I'm like, well, deal with it. What does she do in St. Lawrence, St. Louis? What does she do in St. Louis? So you know that big uh, monument statue that they have? The arch. The arch. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she built it. No, she didn't. She did. And <laughs> guess, and out of very much like our, our, our lawn chair... Yeah. Person, she made it out of a solid piece of steel. Wow. Yeah. Where'd, where'd she score that? Well, she, I, she got a good deal on it. it She's it, got her own mind. At Steel is R Us. <laughs> steel R Us. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. So Scott's making things up again. Nope. Thank you, Annie Broad. Uh, next, we have from Toronto, Ontario. Toronto. Marcin Banach. Well, hi, Marcin. Marcin. Uh, Marcin. Oh. Marcin. Oh, it Marcin. looks like. Martin. Martin? Yeah. So Well, yeah. I don't know. There's an M oh, involved. It's Martin Banach. There's, yeah. There's yeah a, I'm going to pronounce it Banach. Banach? Banach. Mm, okay, sure. Or, or Banach. I'm going to say... Banach. Banach. That's how I'm going to say it. <laughs> All right. So what does Martin do Banach. in Toronto? Uh, Martin. We know it's not watch hockey live because nobody is doing that. We're all watching it on the TV. <laughs> well, Unless he actually live. works in the... Uh, could be. Yeah, we had a Zamboni driver the other week. Well, maybe, yeah, fair maybe. enough. But he's not a Zamboni what driver. What does he do? Uh, what uh, Banach does is... Banach is a script writer. Okay. Yeah, for... Uh, he was the head script writer for, I don't know if you ever saw this little old show called ALF. ALF. Yeah, which stood for Alien Life. Alien Form. Life Form, yeah. yeah. And also Mr. Belvedere. Oh, Mr. Belvedere. Yeah. yeah. So Banach is now a retired script writer, but that, that was the career. Wow. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you guys uh, are out there aren't familiar with ALF and or Mr. Belvedere, clear your weekend. Get listening. Oh well, and yeah. Watching that, even that's you can a even good watch idea. it because it's a television. So you know, the, it's loved those shows. Um, first, oh, wow. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Next, we have somebody. I don't know where she lives, or I don't know where this person lives. Lindsay Lacosta. Oh, Lindsay Lacosta. Yes, uh, Zagreb in Croatia. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what does Lindsay do in Zagreb? Oh. um... Well, geez. Isn't it Zagreb? Yeah, I maybe. Okay. Maybe, anyway. maybe not. Yeah, well, yep. They change it constantly. So Lindsay does. Uh, Lindsay is a mountaineer. Ma oh. So climbs mountains professionally. Professionally. Wow. Yeah, she's got four. Are there a lot of mountains in Croatia, Scott? Are you familiar with Croatia to I, the point I'm that not. you don't know just, anything I've, about the geography? I've just been trusting her. That's okay. all. I've just been trusting. I could be completely lying to mm. me. Uh, which is probably the right thing to do, but uh, yeah, I don't. Maybe not. Yeah. Could a mountaineer 
also be a cave explorer. Like you got, you got to. You mean a spelunker? You got to rappel down. So wouldn't that also you, you, the, the skills are similar? Yeah, but spelunking is a is a whole other well art form. But anyway, so thank you, Lindsay Lacusta from Zagreb, Croatia. Croatia. Yeah. <laughs> Next we have Letitia Mallet. Oh, and she is from Lake Charles, Louisiana. Now Lake Charles. Mm-hmm. When I think Lake Charles, I think General Hospital. Did you watch General Hospital as a kid? I totally did not. Because that was the name that it was of the place. That really? That took place was Lake Charles. No, sorry. I digress. Uh-oh. Now I remember it was Port Charles. Oh. So my yes. whole, my whole diatribe Charles. I was going to go on about yeah. uh, General Hospital is wrong. Well, you got the Charles part right. So what does Letitia, well, maybe Port Charles is on Lake Charles. Could I'm, I'm going to think so. Could be. Yeah, I think so. So what does Letitia do? In Lake Charles. Oh, Letitia, the Morticia. Oh, she's a mortician. Yep, and that's what they call her. Letitia the Morticia. Ha <laughs> ha, because that... She that probably was... hates that. She, I, she really does. I would hate that. Yeah, she really does. Yeah. She really does. That's not going to keep me from broadcasting it to millions of people, though. Right. Morticia the Morticia. Uh, yeah, and so uh, she's new to it. She's only been on the on that job for uh, a week, give or take. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, undecided whether or not she's going to stick with it. I say she does just because of the nickname. I I don't know if I'd have the stomach for that job. Oh, I I could tell you I don't. I could I could try it. I've yeah. been around uh, deceased individuals, not a lot. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't know if I would have the stomach for the uh, what it has to actually take place. Nope, I don't. Nope. Uh, so n- lastly, but not leastly. <laughs> As far as patrons go, we have Christine Jacobson yeah. from Valby, Denmark. Oh, God, I love Denmark. Yeah, or Valby. 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 Uh, what does Christine Jacobson do in Valby? Ah, Christine Jacobson um, curates fjords. She's a fjord curator. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah well, you it's know. It's good work. Yeah. Because it, when you're up in that area, oh, man, there's fjords aplenty. Fjords of Plenty. Yeah, fjord, and that's actually the name of her curating business. Fjords of Plenty. Well, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, uh, patrons. And it looks like we got a uh, a donut money donation. I got a heads up about this, Lorian. Oh, it's Lorian, our, our, our nice lady yep. from Australia. I don't know what it says, but I got a, I got a, I got a. Oh. I don't know if I can read it in an Aussie accent. You could try. Welcome to your birthday, the 5th of August, for you, Mike Brown, creator and host. Look at that. I did it a little bit. So far. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go on because it's <laughs> way too hard. And uh, with me, as usual, is your good friend, a new co-host, Donut Money. Say hello, Donut. <laughs> donut noises. <laughs> the views, information, and opinions expressed during your birthday are greeting, birthday greeting are solely those of the donator and do not necessarily represent those of PayPal, <laughs> its affiliate, nor the parent, nor their parent com- company Afterpay. Donut money is not for the faint of heart <laughs> or celiacs. <laughs> we do not advise advise portion control. Well, we oh, we strongly advise portion control. We are not experts on the money we have sent, nor are we financial advisors. <laughs> Just one ordinary nice lady <laughs> sending some money for Mike's birthday and maybe some for Scott if he's nice now. Yeah. So let's wrap this up. Put on your beanie. No one shits in it. If no, So no one shits in it. Grab yourself a large latte <laughs> and a jar of Vegemite. <laughs> no, don't. I like Vegemite. Scott's eating it too. No. It's time to scarf down a meat pie. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mike. Happy Wednesday, Scott. <laughs> Hope your families are safe. Keep doing what you're doing. XX, Lorian, and her water box. Oh, good old Lorian. Oh, well, good. Thanks, Lorian. Yeah. That, that's a great birthday gift. And you, you did me. say, like, before you, as soon as we said Lorian, you're like, oh, the nice lady. Nice so, lady. Exa- yeah, she got that. Yeah, she's just the best. There you go. Um, next, uh, she didn't leave us a note, this one, but, uh, yesterday, Destiny Edwards sent us some donut money. So thank you, Destiny. Where's she from? Um, um, she's from, uh. Scott's got to think. Oh, Tibet. 
Oh, she's from Tibet. Yeah. What, what part of Tibet, Scott? South Tibet. Oh, she's from South, South Tibet. South Tibet, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's got a nicer climate there. It's easier to uh, right. Tibet in South, in South well, Tibet. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. And she, oh, yeah, she also, what she does in South Tibet mm-hmm. is um, she, she road paver. She what? She paves roads. Oh, she's a paver. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I always say this. Every time I smell a newly paved road, you know what that smells like? Money. 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 I, 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 had, I had a friend who used to, he was a paver. And, oh, yep. He did a little money. I do say that. They, they make the money. Yeah. So thank you, Destiny. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, from people can drive safely Tibet? in South Tibet. Tibet. South drive their Tibet ox over. carts. Yes. <laughs> That's how much knowledge we have of Tibet. It's about we are, it. We are completely ignorant. Yes. And uh, by ignorant, I mean really, really ignorant. I, you know, in many, many topics. Oh, don't get us going. We can talk about <laughs> things we don't know about all day long. Um, next, we have Phoenix Boudreaux. What a great name. And she says, thank you for getting me through this corona bullshit. Oh, well. I hate to break it to you, and sadly not done. Yeah, it's kind of. But uh, we're, you're very we're welcome. not over. You're very welcome. It, it's it has really been. Yeah. Just a fucking gong show. Where is she from? Oh, she's from. Uh, she actually lives in. Okay. The exterior yeah. of the grand tomb in Abu Dhabi. Oh, I kind of figured that. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of figured yeah, that. Yeah, you have good instincts and intuition for these things. And what does Phoenix do in the exterior of the Grand Tomb in Abu Dhabi? Oh, well, what she does is she's the keeper of the Grand Tomb. Well, that she, would just make sense. It so does. she's like the. Uh, have you ever seen um, The Golden Child? I, I, I want the knife. I, 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 Eddie I want Murphy the doing that. Yeah. 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 Ever, being disrespectful to the. As Eddie Murphy does, yeah, uh, kind of like like she's the protector. It's like no people will come and they'll knock on the tomb, and yeah. she'll, she'll open the tomb door and be like, "Can I help you?" And they're like, "We'd like to come into the Body tomb, not home." And and she's like, "Nope, sorry, this isn't a public tomb." And she closes the door. Sometimes they can get pushy. It's a private tomb. It's a it's a private tomb. Yes, most are. Yes, just so you're aware. Yeah. Oh, I was aware. Yeah. It, but the knockers aren't. The knockers. So yeah, so you she, said knockers. Seriously. I did. I did. And so she's like, "This is a private." tomb it's not open for public and they're like oh thank you so much for the info and they walk off sometimes people can get a bit challenging and that's when she has to break out her moves there's nothing like some out of control knockers (laughs) there's nothing like them (laughs) it's nothing like them just wreaking havoc (laughs) all over the place all over the place left right (laughs) up down what's going on havoc wreaked well (laughs) thank you so much phoenix for wreaking havoc in yeah. your tomb. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Thanks to all our patrons and donut money donors past and present for your help to keep us doing what we do. We, if you want to support our show, if you want to show your support of dark poutine, you can subscribe at patreoncom slash dark poutine or for one time donation, you can send us donut money at PayPal via our email, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. Just like that nice lady. That's like that nice lady, Lorian. She sent us some money for my birthday. Nice lady. I'm sure she was typing you while know, she was in her water box. Water box. <laughs> uh, if you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot to, to us if you did. We hope that you don't unsubscribe now that <laughs> we've been such idiots. You can easily find us on iTunes podcast. Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. DarkPatine.com has show notes and other cool stuff. Give us a like or follow on Facebook and Instagram. And most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.